T-minus 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon. I'm John Yembrook with NASA's Office of Communications, and welcome to the NASA Social for the first SLS booster test. So what is SLS, or the Space Launch System? It is NASA's next heavy lift vehicle. It is going to be the largest, most powerful rocket we've ever built. And it's going to take astronauts further into space than ever before to destinations such as an asteroid, to Mars, and beyond. And what exactly is a NASA social? A NASA social is an event that takes the online experience offline, where we invite our social media followers to come out to NASA, go behind the scenes, and share with their friends and followers their experience. And tomorrow, at 9.30 a.m. Mountain Time, 11.30 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern Time, rather, uh, right out here, about a mile away uh, from where this, we're standing right now, uh, the uh, booster test is going to occur, and it's, we're going to fire it up, and it's going, to, uh, it's going to be a monumental test for us. But tomorrow isn't just about the test. It's also about our journey to Mars. We're going to be, we're on a path to Mars right now that is going to take humans, uh, we're developing the capabilities that's going to take humans to Mars in the near future. Uh, to tell us a little bit more about that, we have some panelists here today. They're going to go through and tell us all about the different paths we're doing, uh, including SLS, including our Orion spacecraft, uh, and all the different technologies that are needed to get us there. So tomorrow, at uh, our TV broadcast starts at 9 a.m. Mountain Time, 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern Time, and you can watch it on NASA TV, www.nasa.gov slash NASA TV. And you can participate in the conversation here with us today, uh, with the hashtags SLS Fired Up and Journey to Mars. And for those at home, if you have a question, you can use the hashtag uh, Ask NASA. So let's get started with our first speakers. We have with us today Charlie Precourt, who is the general manager for um, propulsion systems for orbital ATK, and Bill Gerstmeyer, the associate administrator for human exploration and operations mission director for NASA. Charlie? Well, thank you. I appreciate that, John. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Um, big day for us tomorrow and a culmination of uh, many years of, of experienced work uh, during the shuttle program that we've transitioned now to the Space Launch System. Uh, the new booster that you'll see tomorrow is uh, three and a half million pounds of thrust and it'll be a very exciting event for all of us. Um, we're delighted to have you here. Uh, to share in, in this experience. I'm really looking, I will keep my remarks brief because I'm looking forward to interacting with you with your questions and answers. But I'm also excited to see uh, within you in the audience folks with Google Glass and 3D cameras and all those that really appreciate the high tech stuff in, in the world. And, and uh, it's that kind of stuff that's going to get us to Mars. And we at Orbital ATK are just very, very proud to be a part of that. And that journey is e extremely important to all of us. Uh, Orbital ATK, a new name for us. Um, we have just completed a merger, a very successful one. Uh, I'm uh, privileged to lead a division known as Propulsion Systems now, which uh, encompasses uh, three plants here in Utah. 
the one that you're at here today, which focuses on a lot of NASA work, but also uh, work in propulsion for other uh, customers. Um, and uh, in the test area where we're going to conduct this test, in the next week we have several other tests for other customers and, and other programs at DARPA and, and uh, for the folks out at the Wallops Flight Center. So it's a very exciting time for us, lots going on. Uh, I'm also privileged to welcome our NASA leadership team, Bill Gerstenmeyer, uh, delighted to have them here. They're very, very important people to us and uh, we're just thrilled to be a part of their team and making the vision uh, for space exploration and, and the journey to Mars happen. So uh, I look forward to your questions and again, a very hearty welcome from on behalf of all of us at Orbital ATK to all of you to be for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. I mean, again, it's it's awesome to be here. It's it's great for you to be here to experience this event of what's occurring here. And I think what's neat for you in the audience is you get a chance to experience what we kind of see all the time. A lot of times our tests are done kind of behind closed doors or maybe done in a test chamber someplace. They may be done in a wind tunnel someplace. And you don't really get a chance to see what's happening. You know, you got to see this great video of the, the rocket launch you're going to get to actually see one of those solid rocket boosters up close and personal, except it's not going to be going away from you, as it was shown in the video. It's staying right here on the Earth right next to you, so you'll get a chance to really experience it in all its glory. And So really savor it. I mean, take it all in. Do it virtually, but also do it physically. You know, feel the, the vibration come through your feet. Feel the pressure wave hit you. Feel the thermal shock come back from the rocket. Experience that, feel it, and then you are part of the space program. You can do it by being here. You will be a part of it. It won't be just something that you've seen on your screen. You are here, and you're here in a very, very critical test force. So what this test is, is we're, we've got the rocket out there now in the shake and bake oven, right up to 95 degrees, <laughs> right? It's, it's nice and toasty. And then we're going to pull the cover back tomorrow, and it's got to stay above that, that temperature, around 90 degrees is what we want the mean uh, bulk propellant temperature to be, uh, PBMT for those in the know. And so what we want to do is, is then fire the rocket and look at performance. So we'll look at ballistic performance, other things. There's also a tremendous amount of instrumentation on this. We'll do a full gimbal profile to look at how the nozzle operates. We'll understand how the insulation performs. We'll understand what the ballistics are, or how much thrust comes out of the rocket. All those things will be a key piece. And all this data goes into what we call a qualification motor. So we've done our development firings. Those are behind us. Now we're ready to capture data that will actually go into the calculations that will actually be on the launch vehicle when it's time to go fly. Um, so then I think I'd just open a couple more, few more remarks and then I'll open it up for questions. You know, I think we talk about the journey to Mars and in, in, in my thinking, the stress really needs to be on that first word, it's journey. Um, we often get hung up on the destination, but what we're doing here is really a journey. It's gonna take a long time for us to get ready to go do this. You, you get a chance to see how much work goes in to what we do. So you'll see that this qualification motor firing, there'll be another one at cold temperatures to look at the other extreme. We've got uh, the SLS hardware down at uh, Michoud uh, starting to get assembled. We've got a you know, world-class welding facility we're getting checked out and getting it up to speed. We've got the Orion capsule for the uncrewed test flight in 2018 starting to come together. Those pieces are going down to New Orleans to get welded together. So this isn't like a sprint or an easy thing. This takes a lot of work, a lot of expertise. And, and I've had a tremendous day this morning. I got a, a chance to go around with Charlie. We got to talk to the folks that actually do all the work here at, at the site. And to see their excitement and, and see where their hardware fits and to, to actually your presence here makes a difference to them. They see all these folks coming out making trips from, from the East Coast and from West Coast to come here to participate in this activity. This is really something special. So again, um, a tremendous time, savor it, learn what you can, ask us questions, and, and we, we stand ready to, to try to answer any questions you've got. So with that, I'll, we'll, we'll actually interact and, and see what you got for questions. Great, for those in the room, please remember to wait for the microphone, state your full name and where you're from. Uh, why don't you start with me? Hi, my name is Angelica Kalika, and I'm from Boulder, Colorado. I was just wondering, what would a failed test look like? Would it just be a poof of smoke and, and some sad music in the background? Or, <laughs> or and, and then in contrast to that, what would a very successful test look like? Well, the, the uh, <laughs> great question. Um, 
We have been working really hard, so we would determine that you hopefully won't see what a failed test looks like. Um, we, we've had things, failure can range on a large scale. Uh, you can have uh, a delay in the test. We had one of those several years ago. Um, we, uh, every machine that has been built has certain failure modes. We work really, really hard to keep our failure modes from cropping up. Um, what you're gonna see in this test is uh, a full duration test, um, a little over two minutes, and it will um, first start up with a, a, a burst, and then as it stabilizes at full power, will start to gimbal the nozzles, and you'll see the plume actually move around and, and dance up and down. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen a test out here before, the other thing we do is the plume is pointed into the hillside, so it actually will pick up dirt, and uh, that's intentional. We want the soil to mix with the exhaust plume to neutralize it so that it's relatively harmless dust when it comes back to the, the surface of the earth. Um, the real uh, success is in collecting the information that we need to go further to be able to put crew on, on the vehicle in a few years. Um, that's where uh, what we're looking for for success is in some 700 odd channels of data that we're collecting. Uh, pressures, temperatures, vibrations, loads, um, ability of the nozzle to move where we command it, the avionics running correctly. Sometimes we, in, we uh, intentionally put flaws in the motor to see how they'll, they'll perform. We know some of our failure modes are things where the insulation burns through too early. We don't want that to happen. Sometimes we'll put it flaws intentionally into the insulation. We're not doing that this time, but over the life of the, the system, we will intentionally flaw the motor to make sure it's robust and we're protected from those kinds of failure modes that you're alluding to. So for us, a successful test tomorrow is full, full duration, getting the, the nozzles to swing, and then collecting all that data to make sure we've got the design right for the next time around. My name is John Hansel. I'm an author and the diving safety officer for the New England Aquarium up in Boston, or over in Boston. Uh, my question to you is, what differences, or was there a key difference that happened between the DM uh, development motor stuff to this particular uh, static fire. Is there one big thing that you guys, you know, picked up and you uh, made changes to? Thank you. I, well, so uh, the the whole sequence is development means you incrementally change things to get to a final configuration that you qualify, and then that qualification proves that you've repeatedly set yourself up for what crew will fly on. And yes, we did incrementally do things uh, with this design. We've got new avionics in it from what used to be on shuttle. They are far more capable than what we had at that program. Uh, they will operate more reliably um, and, and more capably. Uh, we also changed what's known as the insulator, the material that sits between the wall of the motor uh, casing and the propellant. Because the propellant's burning at about 5,000 degrees, you have to have an insulator in there. And it's a special um, material from a rubber base that uh, ablates and uh, protects the system of, of the case from being compromised by the heat. We actually came up with an insulator that uh, pulled a couple thousand pounds of weight out of the total system, uh, and we had to prove that capability through the DM motors. We ran into a challenge with how we processed that insulator that we finally, uh, knock on wood, we think we have resolved. I'll let the next panel, probably you'll have uh, some of the program managers more deeply go into that with you if you like. Uh, but to give you an idea, we've, we've improved on a lot of the heritage systems to add new um, capabilities that we know we could fold in technologically so we get better performance out of this. The biggest change, though, is we added a segment, which is 25% more propellant for way more performance. Uh, the typical shuttle booster would give you about 3 billion pounds. This is a, a little over 3.5 million pounds of thrust. Uh, so it's going to be the, the kind of performance we need to get uh, our exploration journey to Mars off the ground. SLS flies, and how many do you think you'll do per year afterward? So <laughs> we give, um, we'll do two uh, qualifications. There'll be another one next year a little in the late spring. Uh, and then uh, we are still determining what the tempo will be for ground tests in the long run. Um, and that has to do with, as we ramp up, in, and Bill can talk to this, the, the pace that we fly 
our exploration missions, we will fold in testing as required along the way. You might want to speak to that. And again, I think we've kind of learned from our past experience that it's uh, there's some advantages to actually periodically testing uh, another doing another test firing, even at a full-scale level, because certain things change. If certain products may not be available anymore, we, you know, we take an asbestos out of the rocket, we may change some material properties. Those things will occur over time, and when enough of those changes are there, I think you would like to go back and do another big full-scale test to go do that. We haven't made a formal plan to do that, but we'll figure out the right pace. And, and what we're trying to get with the SLS rocket is we're trying to fly roughly once a year after we get to the, the crewed flights in the 2020s is, is our overall kind of flight schedule. So, um, and we're, you know, we're, we're struggling to see if there's ways to do more, but, but that's kind of where we're thinking, and we're trying to build systems along those lines to support roughly that kind of flight rate. I'm Zach Cromer from St. Louis, Missouri, and I was wondering, um, with the tests for the Ares uh, qualification motors, are there any major changes that differ from the five segments from the Constellation program to the five segments in the SR SLS program? And will you be uh, using any data from the previous tests um, to advance in the SLS? There were some design changes. This is now a side-mounted strap-on booster as opposed to an inline first stage boost. So a lot of it was structural, the way the vehicle attaches. Um, this has attachment points to the core uh, that didn't exist on the Ares design. Um, there were some uh, other changes that I'll let the next panel get into in more detail because they'll have uh, ability to dive deep with you on that. But uh, fundamentally, by moving from a design that had the booster as a core with the rest of the structure standing on top of it to one that attaches to the side, um, we had to make some changes based on that. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, and the other panel can dive into that more. And yes, sorry, we will, we will use not only the data from that program, but all the way back to the beginning of shuttle. One of the things that's important about uh, programs like this is the data you have is really precious because it, 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 it instructs you as to uh, how things uh, are expected to behave in the future, and it also gives you uh, a ground truth as to why you did things to begin with. So that when you encounter a problem like Bill was alluding to with future tests for obsolete materials, uh, process changes, tooling changes, design change needs, uh, we'll know where we came from. We'll know what the starting point was, why we did it the way we did it, and what we can afford to change without messing up the recipe, right? That's the important piece of having all that data from the past. Hi. My name is Emily Bonedrake. I'm a world history teacher at Morris County School of Technology in New Jersey. So instead of a, his a science question, more of a history question, um, we also learn about how technology affects the global political status of the world, how like um, the telegraph, for example, led to the age of imperialism. So do you ever look at sort of the big geopolitical picture, like how this technology could um, evolve into different global politics, whether it's imperialism of Mars or how different countries interact with this science. I don't know. This is so. So, so Charlie looks She's over. A history teacher. Yeah, teacher. This, this is going down in history. Okay. Mars to learning about imperialism of say Africa. See, this, is, this is a great question, right? That this is why I'm an engineer, right? I, I, I couldn't pass either English, public speaking. Or history, <laughs> so 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 we'll, we'll tell you kind of what we're doing. I, what's cool about what we do is, uh, is our business really requires all of us to work together as a team. So there is an unbelievable sense of teamwork in what we do. From from all the folks that are working here on the rocket and getting things ready to, to go, not one single individual can do these activities. I think it's even the same way internationally. You know, we work a lot on the space station with our international partners. There's 15, 16 countries participating on the International Space Station. And what's interesting is the folks that we work with all really share that same passion for exploration and space and pushing human presence into the solar system. So there's something that, that unites us in a way that um, 
maybe transcends culture and transcends some of our individual pieces because that challenge that we're working on makes you kind of put aside those differences and find the areas where you can work together and build together as a team and how can you contribute. So, so to me, there, this is the history lesson may be that these challenges that require us as a globe to come together to go work together may drive cooperation to a level that's totally different. You know, today on Space Station, we're dependent upon the Russians for crew transportation. Some people see that as a bad thing. I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing. This is my teammate. We're in the process of retooling, rebuilding our rockets, getting ready to go fly. So we're going to let them take transportation for a while, and then we'll come back and we'll do it later. We want to end sole reliance so we can have a redundant system in case something doesn't work right, so we want to get there quickly, but we can hand off capability for them for a period of time. Likewise, they need us on space station for power. They get commands through the United States. So we are very mutually dependent upon each other. So that's the best of a, of a cooperation. So I think what we can learn out of space flight and learn what we're doing, if you think a single nation is going to go to Mars, I don't think that's going to happen. We're, we're going to go to Mars as some international cooperation group. We've already got the Europeans participating with the service module on the Orion capsule. So we're already starting to reach out internationally. So I think the thing that history will teach us is how these big challenges forced us to work together as a globe and move forward. And, and maybe that's the, the lesson. I liked your story, your story earlier today about Butch coming home, and home was really not in the U.S., right? And yeah. one day we might think about home being the, you know, the cislunar space that we live in. Yeah, what, yeah what, we, what we talked about today is t tomorrow night, right? This is what's exciting, right? I have a team now in, in Kazakhstan ready for our crews to come home. And, and what Charlie and I were talking about was when the crews land in Kazakhstan, they say they're home. And that's really not home, right? Home is here in the U.S., but that is their new home. The surface of the earth is home because they've been on station for six months. So what we like, what we're excited about is someday, right, when we're going to Mars and we have permanent presence on Mars, you come back to the moon earth system that's your new home so now you're in orbit around the moon and you're going to call that home that's when we've really pushed the human population into the solar system hi i am jeff bond I'm from the san francisco bay area i'm a google glass explorer and it's nice that you use that word because that's what we do we explore so um thank you for presenting this information answer a lot of questions i had as a kid and give us a lot of information to work with um, I want to ask you about that thrust measurement. Obviously, the thrust is being generated. So at the opposite end, you have like some gauges that are picking that information up. And I want to ask you specifically, once you start to vector that rocket, you know, two, three, four, up to nine degrees, can you also read exactly that thrust measurement in three axis to kind of make sure you understand that data fully? Yeah, we have a thrust block on the front end of the engine that is highly instrumented. And um, the, uh, the booster is in it is, is a long device and you'll notice that there are a couple of what we call mid-span supports that hold it uh, in a position that we want it to be in to um, represent flight conditions to the degree we can. It's normally going to be vertical, can't test it that way, so we, we make some compromises. Um, but once the, the motor ignites, the pressure inside the case increases up to a thousand or higher pounds per square inch and so that pressure actually stiffens the case and it'll actually rise to more horizontal lift itself off of those supports and so now we get a, as true an indication of the kind of forces that are being transmitted into the thrust block as we can uh, when we vector it we do a, a con uh, see those movements in the, the traces so we can uh, you know through analysis we can determine what is actually going on there and again, the next panel, you're going to have a real expert or two that can dive into how that was all put together. So bring that one up again. Hi, I'm, I'm John Bills. I'm a producer for Sci-Fi Cantina on YouTube and based in Utah County. My question is, what do you do with the test booster after you've fired it? It'll just be sitting there. What are your plans once it's fired off and your test is over? Yeah, that's a good question. So the most of the hardware is reusable. Um, and uh, what you'll find is um, uh, the cases that make up this booster have been around and recovered and reused since uh, the program began on shuttle. Uh, several of them on the last test I had flown as an astronaut on a few of my shuttle flights. As a matter of fact, we still have the, the hardware from the first space shuttle mission, so it's, it's made, uh, made its, its worth in the program by being able to reuse it. 
Um, we can't reuse the majority of the nozzle because it is ablative and it, uh, it has to be rebuilt. The metal hardware that makes up the nozzle we can recover and reuse. The hydraulic systems, the electronics, the avionics, a lot of that stuff will be reused. Uh, what we will do immediately after the test, of course, is we will start dissecting what we see in it uh, to make sure we measure things like the depth of the, the insulator material remaining. We know how far it ablated back and it performed correctly and, and a lot of things of that nature that we want to dissect it first and completely understand how it performed before we go completely recycling it and reusing it. A lot of people are wondering, how close do you think we are to finding life on another planet? <laughs> Man, I don't know. Hey, I, I, boy, I don't. I, it's interesting. We, you know, we have the rovers on Mars, and, and they've been looking for water, and, and they're, you know, they're looking for life. It, it's interesting question. It's interesting. It's more of a science question. It, it's interesting because on human spaceflight, I, I'm kind of specialized, so I'm looking at the other way. How do I move? life into the solar system and then we'll know there's life on Mars when I put crews on the surface of Mars so then there won't be any debate so so I'm trying to actually drive the, the equation the other way so instead of searching for life we're trying to put life into the solar system so so, so we'll see how that goes and but uh, Anyway, but it's it's also we're doing a lot of interesting things. The next rover will have uh, an oxygen generation system on it, and the, uh, the idea there is to actually pull oxygen out of the Martian atmosphere to see if we could use it for human presence. The Curiosity rover on Mars today, it has a radiation monitor, so we're monitoring what the radiation is for humans to be on the planet. Um, Mars is a good place to go because it has water for us. It has temperatures that are tolerable almost to us as humans. So it is, it is probably the place that we can go that's farthest away that can sustain human life without us having to take everything with us to, that, to, to Mars. So at NASA, when we talk about the journey, we think of it as three regions, right? We, we call it the Earth-reliant region. That's where space station is. So we're using space station to understand how the human body adapts to microgravity. Can a human stay in a microgravity condition for like a three-year journey to Mars? We also need to build systems that can operate for an extended period of time and not break down and, and require maintenance. So that's in the Earth-reliant region. Then the Proving Ground region, which is where this hardware is going, SLS and Orion will go first around the moon and desist lunar space. That's a place where we learn the skills. So in the you know, Earth-reliant region, we're only a couple hours away. If something goes wrong on station, you can be back in, in a couple hours. When you go to the region around the moon, it's now probably five, six days to get back. So that's a great proving ground or a great place to learn skills, to learn how to operate without the Earth gravity, to learn how you might maneuver a human spacecraft throughout the solar system. That's the proving ground region. Then eventually when we go to Mars, that's the Earth independent region. And by that point, we need to be able to break the tie with the home planet, carry our supplies with us to be there, sustain ourselves in an environment totally different from the Earth. So we look at those three regions as part of this journey to Mars that you've, you've, that you've, you've discussed. So what's kind of cool here in the next couple days, like tomorrow, we'll get to see two pieces of that. We'll get to see the crew return from space station, so that's the Earth-reliant piece, and we'll get a chance to see the SLS uh, test firing tomorrow for the solid rocket motor, and, and that's the beyond low Earth orbit or to the, the proving ground region, the equipment we're building there. So, so it's a pretty exciting time for us in human spaceflight to see all this activity occurring in a, in a fairly short period of time. I can't help but think from your question about when I was, uh, when Bill and I were in grade school, I used, we used to have encyclopedias, now there's just Wikipedias, but I have a science, I still have these science encyclopedias and you open up the chapter on planets and there was only suspicion that there might be planets in other places besides our own solar system. And now we've found hundreds of them. So who knows when we'll find that life, but it, you know, that's part of, of the search for knowledge that we're all about here. And I loved his perspective on we're putting life out there first to, to go find what's there because we, we, we're going to be on that journey for a long time. One last question. Uh, Jason Ryan for SpaceFlightInsider.com, and I guess this one's for Gers. Can you detail the flow that we can expect in the lead-up to Exploration Mission 1 in 2018? Yeah, sure. I, and again, you'll, you'll see this, this test firing tomorrow. Then you'll see another test firing of SLS uh, next year, again, looking at the lower temperature region to understand the characteristics of the rocket. 
There'll be a lot of activity occurring at Stennis uh, fairly soon. I think in April when the high pressure industrial water system gets back online and we can start testing, you'll see us uh, using the shuttle main engines to be tested. Uh, down at down at Stennis, purpose there is to really ring out the new controller. There's a brand new uh, controller for the solid or for the uh, liquid uh, uh, rocket motors, the old shuttle main engines that that are down at Stennis. That works going on. Um, you, we're down at we're ready to start putting together the tank down at MAF, the the core tank. We have some things with our vertical uh, weld center that, that there's some alignment problems that we're working through. The teams are, are doing that. We'll do our first confidence weld to make sure that those go together. We'll then test, make sure that works right. Then we'll start manufacturing probably this summer for that core stage. Um, that's pretty exciting work that's happening there. Um, we have the Orion capsule that will be used on that flight in 2018. The large aluminum panels are starting to get manufactured at various locations throughout the U.S. Um, those will come down to Michoud. They'll get welded into a capsule. Then that capsule gets transported to Florida. That probably shows up in January, February of next year. Then that gets outfitted with all the avionics, electronics, all those systems. A heat shield gets added underneath, and then, then we're ready to go do uh, exploration mission one that's that's coming up in 2018. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do a lot better job of of letting the, the public see what we're doing through all these activities. So we're going to try to invite you to more tests to see what we're doing because we haven't done this much development within NASA for a long time. You know, we probably have not done this much development since probably the Apollo era and maybe a little bit when we were starting to build the shuttle back in the in the 70s. So this is a unique chance for you to see and participate what it takes to get a rocket ready to go fly so you can understand how this, you know, developmental program works, how the qualification program works, and how this hardware all comes together to actually put a human on it, that we're ready and we have enough confidence in this system that when the human's on there, we're ready to go fly. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time overall. And then one other thing I would add, too, is sometimes we get, we get, we don't think of human spaceflight in the entire continuum. You know, we're doing commercial crew, so so commercial crew transportation. We just awarded two contracts to to uh, Boeing and SpaceX. Um, you know, they're going to be flying probably in 2017. So probably the first crewed flights will be to low Earth orbit the space station by by some commercial companies. And I see this really as all of human spaceflight. So it's not an exploration program and a low Earth orbit program. It's what I described to you. It's an Earth reliant region. It's a proving ground region, and it's an Earth independent region. And that's a continuum of human spaceflight. So I think it's worthwhile to, to watch all these activities, see what's happening. We'll try to share with you as much as we can what's going on. Keep asking questions to us. Keep making us think. You know, you bring a unique perspective. You, you know, we see this all the time. We've grown up in the industry. Some things we take for granted, but a fresh set of eyes, a new perspective is really, really helpful to us. So, so keep thinking. You know, tweet questions. Tweet really hard questions to John. John loves these really hard questions. He can't deal with them, so then he sends them to me. I can't deal with them. I send them to the next panel. So, so you get to see us all work here. But, but think of those hard questions and make sure that, that you, you keep us engaged because we want you to be with us on this journey to Mars. So thanks. Charlie, Bill, thank you. We are on a journey to Mars, and this next video will give you a little feel what it's going to look like.
Welcome back. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next panel. Uh, starting from left to right, we have Bill Hill, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development at NASA Headquarters. Todd May, the Space Launch Systems Program Manager. Charlie Lundquist, Orion Crew and Service Module Manager. And Mike Bolger, the Ground Systems Development Operations Program Manager. We'll start off with Bill. Good afternoon and welcome to our uh, QM1 event. Um, it's a great opportunity for you all to, to witness this, uh, this event. One of the things that uh, as we were touring this morning, somebody mentioned and it's kind of physics of the world. That is, uh, once this thing lights off tomorrow, you'll see it, you'll feel it, and then you'll hear it just because that's the way physics will progress through with the, with the actual speed of light and, uh, and the speed of sound. So. Uh, Hopefully you'll look forward to seeing that tomorrow and, uh, and, and witnessing that and sharing that with the, uh, the rest of the world through your treat, tweets and uh, Facebook and, 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 and other social media. Um, our activity is, is uh, looking to explore and pioneer the solar system. Uh, that's what we're doing. As Gersh said, we're, we're progressing uh, human presence out into the solar system. Um, and we want to maintain, once we get there, we want to stay. It's not going to be a uh, go out and, and touch base and, and, and then do something else. We're going out to stay, and that's our intent. Um, today we're building the found what we call the foundational exploration capabilities with the uh, Space Launch System, uh, the Orion spacecraft, and then the ground systems to support uh, the launch preparation and launch of, of uh, SLS and Orion. Um, those aren't going to be the only things we're going to need. Uh, we're going to need uh, habitation modules to go further out into space and sustain human life for longer periods of time. Uh, and as we progress out, we're going to have to learn how to, uh, how to live and operate and, and provide logistics for, um, for our crews as they go deeper and deeper into space. They also have to be more autonomous in their operational uh, capabilities, our crews this is. Um, because as we go further out in space, as you know, physics gets to the point where uh, we have a large time delays on communications. Uh, once we get to the, to the Martian area, it could be up, upwards of, uh, of 20 minutes uh, each way. So um, they're gonna have to learn how to, to be autonomous. We're, we're gonna have data feeds back, obviously. Uh, but the ground systems and, and the ground crews are not going to be able to uh, actively look over their shoulders and, and continue to do things. Um, tomorrow's activity is, is the second major uh, activity that we've done recently. We did an exploration systems or exploration flight test in December with the Orion spacecraft. Uh, we'll do this one uh, tomorrow and then we'll uh, do another one uh, winter, spring uh, next year, uh, another QM, uh, the QM2 test. Um, as Gers said, we're making a lot of progress. We're, we're looking to, uh, to make a lot of progress. Uh, uh, 2015 is gonna be a pivotal year and 2016 will even be better. So we're pressing on to, uh, to a launch sometime of uh, Exploration Mission 1 in 2018. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to uh, Todd. Hey, thanks, Bill. Hey, it's good all, to see all of y'all here today. It's going to be a, a, a great time tomorrow. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, a lot is going on in the Space Launch System program right now. Uh, we're up and running it at full speed. Uh, I would say we've got a full head of steam. and We've got a lot of projects going on in, in parallel. Um, my job is to field the rocket, basically everything below Orion, and uh, get it down to the Cape and hand it over to uh, Mike Bolger, who will talk to you here in a minute. Uh, but just working through the parts of the rocket, uh, Bill mentioned uh, the engines. Um, we actually pulled off a, uh, uh, the, our first engine test down at Stennis in January. Uh, it's a brand new state-of-the-art controller. Um, we're fielding a controller that is going to be less than half the price of the old SSME controllers, and yet it's uh, got state-of-the-art control of the engine itself. Uh, so that's a big thing. Uh, we've actually taken the facility down for a couple months because we're putting in brand new uh, water lines, and, and these are very high-pressure water lines, and, and they're not small. They're over 90 inches uh, in diameter, and so you got to dig some big holes and uh, replace the lines. But in April, when we come back up, we'll be on a, 
a pretty steady cadence of engine testing. We hope to get about seven done this year. So uh, if you're you're down around that that area, um, listen for a loud boom. Uh, maybe we can host one of these down there. Um, moving outside to the boosters themselves, you got a pretty good update from uh, Bill and Charlie. Uh, a few things that uh, they didn't mention that are different uh, about this booster. Um, if you if you look closely at the aft attach, um, it's actually lower with respect to the nozzles. We flip that that bottom segment to give ourselves more space because the core is longer than the external tanks. Uh, so if you're paying close attention, little things like that. Uh, up in the top, we used to have um, uh, parachutes and things like that because we used to have a couple of ships that would go out and get them and bring home. Um, we've gotten. Uh, rid of all that, we're going to let these things go out into the ocean and become reefs at this point. That that lowers the operations cost. Uh, another big change since the Constellation program is we ran a series of value stream mapping exercises, uh, which is a, a fancy way of saying we've become much more efficient in how we build them. We, in some cases, we've reduced as much as 50 percent the amount of effort uh, it takes to make one of these things. And so all of those changes have been incorporated into it. Uh, you heard that this one is a five-segment motor. Uh, one of the things we found uh, when we were running the development motor firings is we were getting a little bit of eccentric uh, nozzle erosion. Uh, we think that might have been due to the sag. Uh, you heard Charlie talk about the sag before we pressurized this thing. And so we've added a support in the middle of it to get rid of that sag, and so we hope to see that uh, eccentric erosion go away. So just a couple of little uh, nits to be looking for um, in, when we get this test data. Uh, but the program's going really, really well. They, uh, out here in Clearfield, about 50 miles away, they've been testing the new avionics and software systems. They're done testing that now and have delivered that to Marshall, uh, where we have a systems integration lab where we test the entire uh, rocket uh, avionics suite there. Um, and they've completed their critical design review, and so they're well into the build phase. Uh, moving to the center of the rocket, uh, a lot of activity going on with the core. Uh, we completed the critical design review last year. Uh, you heard you heard uh, Bill say that uh, we got a lot of hardware down at Mishu right now, over 40,000 square feet. I think some of you NASA social folks got a chance to see some of that uh, this time last year. Uh, so that's just a piece of what's going on. That's just the structural pieces. Uh, the avionics boxes are going through qualification all around the country right now. Um, we also have uh, structural test articles being built at Marshall, and these are over 100 feet tall. Uh, one of them is over 200 feet tall. These are strong backs where we'll take these, these core segments and actually put them through their paces uh, mechanically. Uh, the Pegasus barge that used to, uh, to move the external tank around, we actually had to cut it in half and add about 65 feet, and so now it's longer than a football field because that's what it takes to put the core of the rocket on, and we'll barge that thing over to Stennis. Uh, so a lot of ancillary programs going on with the core as well. Um, we have a lab uh, called uh, the, the Systems Integration Lab where all those avionics are coming in. We've been writing flight software. Uh, we're up to version 10 now, and our, um, we're running that through its testing now. We've got version 11 going through what we call scrums, which are the uh, incremental development of that. The next one beyond that will be the one we actually do when we run the, the, the green run test. Uh, that brings me back to Stennis, where we have the B-2 stand. We'll actually take the entire core with all four engines, uh, put it up on top of that B-2 stand, and, and run a full mission duration with uh, the four liquid engines at once. And that'll be the loudest noise we've heard uh, in, in engine world, liquid engine world, in 40 years. Um, so come back for that one as well. Uh, but that B-2 stand is coming along really well. That's a, 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 a very big project. If, as you can imagine, you've got to hold that thing down. You've got to stick this core up in the air and... And, and light it and, and light these four engines. Um, and so that's coming along well. Uh, moving up, uh, you see the, the conical section of the rocket where it next down, that's the LVSA. Uh, they have completed their design and are now building the structural test article. Uh, from there up to the bottom of the Orion, you've got the LVSA, Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter. You've got the uh, ICPS, or the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, which is fancy for a Delta IV upper stage. And then the, the MSA, which is the adapter that attaches it to the Orion. That stack right now, all of those structural test articles are being built. So the tankage for the ICPS is being built, the MSA structural test article is being built, the S LVSA structural test article is being built, and all of those will also go into a, a stand and go through its structural testing. Uh, so a lot going on in the pieces of the rocket. Uh, we are about uh, a month and a half away from our critical design review on the entire rocket. 
Um, that's been a big effort. We've been through three design cycles now, and that's wrapping up. Uh, I'll have a formal readiness review on uh, April 2nd with my chief engineer and chief safety officer. We'll review and make sure we are ready to go. Uh, we have a, a punch list of items we're working through right now, but we feel pretty good uh, about getting into critical design review. Once we get past that, we now consider that the entire vehicle is in verification and build and test uh, phase, which is a big shift in the program. Uh, and we start thinking about making the commitments in terms of delivering everything uh, to our other partners here, um, who will talk to you here in a minute. Um, uh, one interesting thing, I uh, just got back from Florida. Uh, Mike will talk a little more about it, but we have a set of tests coming up called LETF, and it's where, if you saw in the video, those swing arms that come out uh, from the rocket and they're attached to the VAB. Um, it looks pretty interesting on the, on the video, but I will tell you, um, they're building up the, the uh, articles to test that down there right now, and the scale of just those tests blew me away. Uh, it's, it's one of those arms is probably one and a half times the width of, of this building. So when you see that thing swing out, it's not just a couple of pixels, it's a big old piece. And so we're building up our, our pieces to deliver the plates uh, to, uh, to Ground Systems Office and then they'll perform the testing for us. So uh, a lot going on. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Charlie. Okay, thanks Todd. So I'm gonna give you an update on the Orion spacecraft. Orion sits on top of this immensely powerful rocket, uh, and uh, thank you, Todd, for delivering us to space, where uh, Orion will conduct uh, exploration class missions of up to four astronauts uh, for a duration of up to 21 days. Um, so we had a, a test several months ago called Exploration Flight Test One that Bill mentioned, and I'm gonna provide an update to you on, on what we learned from that very important test flight. Uh, to refresh your memory, uh, we launched from Kennedy Space Center uh, on a Delta IV Heavy, which lifted us to orbit uh, on December 5th. Uh, the mission lasted four and a half hours. We circled the Earth two times. Uh, we went to an apogee, which is the furthest point away from, from the ground, of 3,600 miles. And uh, we came back, uh, we went through the Valinal belts twice, and that's an area of high ionizing radiation, which uh, was a critical test of our flight avionics systems. And then we came back, re-entered the atmosphere at about 20,000 miles per hour, which was a key uh, test of our uh, thermal protection system that protects the astronauts from the extreme heat of re-entry. Uh, we experienced about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the heat shield, which is only about one and a half inches thick. And so uh, we gotta protect the crew. Uh, they're not very far away from those uh, temperatures. So um, we, uh, we landed. Uh, fine, the uh, decelerator system performed uh, flawlessly. Uh, the uh, Orion spacecraft touched down in the ocean about uh, 600 miles south of San Diego off the uh, Baja Peninsula, and it was uh, subsequently recovered by Mike and his team. Thank you for that, and uh, brought back to Kennedy Space Center, where we've been undergoing a lot of post-test analysis uh, since then. So um, during the mission, um, the, the spacecraft systems, almost all of them performed uh, nominally. We were very pleased about that. Um, there are over 17 separate uh, <laughs> separation events controlled by pyrotechnics. Those all performed within microseconds of when they were supposed to, and all flawlessly. Uh, I mentioned the heat shield itself. Uh, that heat shield is very complicated structure comprised of over 300,000 individually gunned uh, honeycomb cells of ablative material. Uh, and it seemed to perform quite well. Um, we're actually still studying it uh, as we speak. It was uh, removed from the spacecraft, delivered to uh, Marshall Space Flight Center where our TPS engineers are, are looking at it as we speak. Um, the, uh, the avionics system uh, did quite well. We didn't uh, undergo any uh, single part uh, interrupts from the ionizing radiation and the uh, decelerator system. Uh, all 11 parachutes deployed nominally, and uh, we uh, actually landed upright, uh, and uh, uh, so we were uh, pretty happy about everything that happened. Um, since then, uh, our engineers have been pouring through about 1,100 data channels that we uh, uh, collected data during the mission. Um, we've also been, uh, you know, uh, going over the vehicle uh, and checking it out to make sure, uh, you know, kicking the tires, seeing how well it worked. Um, we just released a 90-day report. It was a very comprehensive report that uh, uh, um, documented the results of our findings to date. Um, and uh, 
We're still learning lessons though from it. Like I mentioned, the heat shield at Marshall where we're uh, undergoing additional coring and sampling. So, so there's a lot to learn from this mission. We're gonna get everything we can out of it. But I wanted to say that uh, we learned a lot even before we flew, just building uh, the spacecraft. Uh, we exercised a lot of what we need to going forward for exploration. Um, we actually had over 10,000 uh, engineering drawings that were released, and most of those are gonna play forward. Um, we had over a quarter of a million individual piece parts that were integrated onto the spacecraft, and they were provided by over a thousand uh, suppliers uh, within 42 different states, including ATK, I might add, here in Utah. Um, we also had uh, over 17,000 wires on the spacecraft, uh, 26,000 different verifications, and nearly half a million line, software lines of code. So it's a very complicated uh, spacecraft, and we were very pleased at how well it worked together. And so uh, this is all gonna play forward for EM-1. And so a little bit about EM-1, uh, Bill mentioned the, uh, the fact that we're already building parts of that spacecraft now. Um, the uh, crew module pressure vessel components are being machined as we speak at various vendors across the country. Uh, the first uh, element has actually of the Pathfinder, which is what we use to validate our weld structures, uh, has already been delivered to Michoud and we'll be assembling that and doing our Pathfinder welds over the course of the uh, summer and fall, and then begin the uh, welding of the flight structure. We hope to deliver that uh, early in 2016. We have completed our Delta uh, preliminary design review. Our critical design review is only five months away, and so we're uh, really looking forward to uh, uh, continuing uh, to build upon the uh, lessons learned that we got with that flight test. Thanks, Charlie. <clears throat> so at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, we've been really busy working to prepare the launch infrastructure. And by that, I mean the facilities, the ground systems, and the operational procedures um, that, will, that will create the 21st century spaceport that will be the springboard um, for SLS and Orion in our journey to Mars. Um, at the launch pad, launch complex um, 39B, We've been developing a very flexible and adaptive architecture. We call it a clean pad approach, where we've removed the old shuttle-specific structure that was on the launch pad, um, and we now have what we call clean pad um, that will be able to support the SLS and Orion and even other launch vehicles and spacecraft as we move forward. Um, we've been really busy at the launch pad. We've, create, we've constructed 500-foot-tall lightning towers. Um, we've done refurbishment on the huge 800 or 900,000-gallon um, cryo tanks that we have out there. We've recently awarded a contract for the construction of the flame deflector and then the refurbishment of the flame deflector and a host of other projects where um, Complex B or 39B is really a beehive of activity these days. Um, also at the vehicle assembly building, so that's the, the iconic um, piece of our, of our um, landscape. You can see it as you fly in, um, 500 foot tall and, and 500 feet across. Um, that's, the, that's the facility where we stack and we integrate and we do the initial test and checkout of the launch vehicle and the spacecraft. We've, we've got four high bays in there, each, again, 500 feet tall, each large enough to hold a Statue of Liberty inside. This, this is a massive building. Um, high Bay 3 is going to be the one that we're going to use for SLS and Orion. Um, we've taken out the old shuttle work platforms, and we're in the process of constructing 10 new work platforms that we'll use as we stack and, and test out SLS and Orion. What's neat about these is um, these launch platforms can move up or down 10 feet, and they come with a, an insert in the, in the platform so that we can conform to different outer mold lines of the rocket. So this will really help us as the SLS and Orion evolves. Um, we'll be able to evolve more easily with it without going through major construction of facilities type projects. So again, trying to become flexible flexible and adaptable as we move forward. We've got another uh, number of other projects going on in the vehicle assembly building. It's a 50-year-old facility, so we're upgrading our fire X systems, our low voltage systems, um, some of the big doors, um, and then the cranes that, that do the lifting. So again, another very busy area at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, we're also upgrading our launch, our launch control center. Um, firing room one is, will be the firing room that we will support testing of the SLS and Orion from. We've got a new um, state-of-the-art open system architecture um, command and control system in firing room one. We're developing the system software that will run that control system. It's about half done. Um, and we're just now getting started on all of the application software, the displays and the automated um, test procedures that our engineers will use to ultimately do the test out of the SLS and Orion. Couple other projects. Um, Todd made re reference to our mobile launcher. Mobile launcher is the platform and the tower that provides that direct ground um, to flight vehicle interface. 
Um, it's a, a close to 400 foot tall tower um, that sits on top of on the platform, and then all of our ground systems run through the mobile launcher and run through the umbilical arms to provide the power, the comm, um, the propellants, the purge gases, all the things that the rocket needs from the ground while it's on the ground. And so we're busy working on that now. We've been, um, that, that mobile launcher was originally designed for Ares 1X, so we've been strengthening it um, so that it's stronger for the bigger rocket. We've changed the um, exhaust hole where the flames shoot out when, when we do the launch since it has a different shape than what the Ares 1X had. Um, and we've also been making room for all of those ground systems that were in the process of finishing up the designs this year. So this year we'll finish the designs on the ground systems, we'll finish the tower mods and the platform mods. Um, we'll, start to, we'll start to install some of those ground systems into the mobile launcher. We'll take our umbilical arms, which are really that, that last point of connection, and there's the umbilical plate right at the end, the ground plate and the flight plate. We'll take those over to that launch equipment test facility that Todd mentioned, um, and we'll really run those umbilicals through the ringer, making sure that when we actually go to launch that they disconnect the way that we expect them to and that we don't have any issues when we get there. That'll go on for the next couple years um, and be a really busy and exciting area. Todd talked a little bit about the length of the arms one of the tail service mast umbilicals, because you don't get a, always a sense for the scale, just how big this rocket is, but the tail service mast umbilicals are down at the base of the mobile launcher. They're the umbilicals that we do the fueling of the um, liquid cryogenics. Um, those things are 38 feet tall, right? So it's almost like a, a four-story building is just the umbilical at the base of, at the base of this rocket. Um, let's see, crawler transporter is an asset we've had with us since the Apollo program. It's like a... Um, it's like a massive tank almost. It's like 115 foot across and 130 feet the other way. It looks like one of those rebel forces in a Star Wars movie, if you've seen some of the tanks in that. Um, and, and this, the crawler transporter, we put the mobile launcher and the rocket on top um, in, inside the vehicle assembly building and we roll out to the launch pad at, at the blazing speed of a half a mile an hour. Um, we, it's, it's a really neat, um, work of art in that as you go up the hill on, on complex 39B, um, it has these jacking equalization and leveling cylinders that keep the rocket perfectly vertical so that as you go up the hill, we maintain perf perfect ver verticality. We've been doing 20 year life cycle mods on the crawler transporter for the last couple of years. We just wrapped up roller bearing replacements. Um, we've been working on the gearboxes. We've still got a, some um, work to do on the jacking equal equalization and leveling sensors that, or the cylinders, the gel cylinders, um, but we'll be finishing that up in the next couple of years and the crawler transporter is going to be ready to go. So o overall at Kennedy, we're, we're making tremendous progress. The EFT-1 Orion launch um, was really a morale boost. The whole place was really electric down there. It was exciting and it was fun. It's going to be the same way here tomorrow, and we're excited to be a part of that. Um, each of these tests are so important. They represent you know, clear and obvious progress to us. Um, they make us realize that our first SLS Orion launch date is coming up soon. We know we've got a lot of work to do. We know it's going to be hard, but it's exciting, and there's nothing we'd rather be doing. Um, and, and when that flight hardware shows up, we're going to be ready at the Kennedy Space Center to process it. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thanks, all. I appreciate it. We have uh, some time for some questions. Remember in the room, if you have a question, to keep your hand raised, uh, stand and state your name of, uh, and wait for the microphone. Uh, for those watching at home, you can use the hashtag AskNASA, and we'll try to get to your question either here or online. So I think we have our first one right at the top front. Yeah, I'm uh, Lee Jensen from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm a software developer, and so I'm, I'm curious about the uh, avionics systems. A lot of talk has been made about, uh, you know, the upgrades from the heritage systems. And I'm curious, are, are most of the systems these days running on custom ASICs, or is it all, like, general-purpose computer hardware that uh, uh, you guys are just writing custom software for? What, what's the kind of breakdown there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see, I think that one was for Orion. Uh, well, so I'm the hardware guy. Uh, we, uh, I know we try to minimize the customization uh, because of the expense. Uh, and so you won't find a lot of the custom ASICs in the Orion architecture. That's probably about all I can tell you on that. Yeah, on the ground, we're running um, IBM servers with an with a IBM flavor of Unix. Um, we, we use COTS where we can, but we do find that we're, we do develop a lot of custom code for our system software, the things that allow us to do the basic command and control and monitoring of the data that comes down. Um, and then we do use um, some COTS tools to help us with the displays that we create um, and also with the scripting, the, the test procedures that we're writing. So it's kind of a mix of both for us on the ground. 
Yeah, I'd say the same thing. Um, we've got some uh, a panel that can tell you specifically about the boosters when they get up here, but. Uh, as far as the core of the rocket itself, um, that's based off a, a design that's uh, current assets that fly today. Um, and then the ICPS is really um, a Delta IV uh, architecture. And, uh, and that Delta IV and Atlas V are going to what they call common avionics. And um, in that case, we're, we're just kind of uh, letting the contractor lead the way. Um, that's, that's the plan that they're going to from a corporate perspective. My name's John Hansel. I'm the uh, diving safety officer for the New England Aquarium. And I'm saying that specifically because, Todd, you had mentioned that um, these new solid rocket boosters won't have parachutes. Uh, and therefore, I was just wondering about their downrange water landing. Um, is that area like a highly protected area? And also, will these things maybe become artificial reefs uh, down the road? Yeah, I think that's probably what's going to happen with them. They'll become uh, artificial reefs at some point, and uh, by the time they get to the bottom of the ocean, they're inert, and uh, and so we actually think we're helping the environment in, in that perspective by creating a reef place for the uh, the underwater creatures to grow. My name is. Uh my name is John Darrington. I'm from Rexburg, Idaho. My question is more on the on the fiscal side of things. With the administration change coming in 2016, uh, are you expecting any kind of budget issues? And what kind of budget do you need yearly to make the uh, the, the deadlines of putting um, a crew in space in 2018? Thank you. Well, right now we're working um, very closely with Congress and with our, with the administration to uh, to one request money and then. Uh, get uh, appropriations. We've been very fortunate in the last three years of getting uh, appropriations above what the president's request has been, and that's helped us uh, make more progress, reduce some of the risk, and, and buy down some of the margin that we uh, we have to launch it in 2018. Um, with any administration change, whether it be within the same party or not, um, you always get some sort of change. Uh, New administrations want to put their mark on, on different areas. Um, we'll see as we get through 2016 how much in the uh, in the election or in, in the um, uh, campaigns, how much space plays a role and how much policy discussion there is relative to what we're doing with exploration. Um, we will set up a, as, as we always do, set up a transition team to work with whoever's coming in. And so we'll, we'll work through it. Our goal is to make as much progress um, from a hardware standpoint, uh, make as much progress as we can before the election, um, and, and so we can sustain some uh, inertia uh, coming through 16, 17, and hopefully into 18. Hi, my name is Jessica Zarnowski. I'm from Salt Lake, and I'm with the Salty Geek podcast. Um, with mentioning that you're not going to be recovering any of these rockets, what was the decision behind that besides just monetary, and what sort of toxicity testing has gone into on the environmental effects of that? Yeah, so um, the, the decisions were primarily fiscal, um, F-I-S-C-A-L, uh, fiscal. Um, the, uh, the idea being that um, we actually have to, keep uh, what we used to call the NASA Navy. We had to, we had to keep ships uh, operating. Uh, the parachute operations themselves cost money. Um, I want to say that the number was on the order of uh, higher than $50 million a year just to have that piece of the infrastructure. And uh, being that we had uh, eight flight sets of boosters uh, already at hand, uh, it was a pretty easy decision to make. And um, particularly with the fact that as we move into the future, we're going to look for a, a new booster that is designed for uh, to be uh, uh, disposable so that we can optimize that for the future. So uh, keeping the operational cost of keeping the parachutes going and the, uh, um, the, the, the NASA Navy going, uh, it, was a, it was a fairly easy fiscal decision to make. Harris. I'm with the Space Foundation in Colorado Springs. I handle their social media. Um, I was able to do the Orion social, which I actually have some friends watching, so hello. They keep tweeting about me on TV. Um, <laughs> but after going to Orion, I saw how much my posts were just inspiring young adults out there. And unfortunately, when the shuttle program went away, a lot of people 
thought that the United States didn't have a space program at all anymore, unfortunately. So I'm curious now with Orion and with SLS and for all this being such a big deal for us, what all is being done to inspire not only our future astronauts, but the future developers of this technology? Well, I, <clears throat> first of all, I, as, as uh, Bill Gerstemeyer indicated, you know, we're not out of the business. We're flying uh, space station 24-7, 365. Um, we're making great progress with research there. Um, we're, we're teaming with uh, commercial entities to, to try to develop a unique capability with uh, n no gravitational influences so we can do research. And so the commercial industries can do research, pharmaceutical, whatever. Um, I think everything we do every day inspires uh, um, folks to get into science, technology, engineering, and, and math. And, and we see that, um, especially with events like this, with events like uh, EFT-1, um, we see how well we inspire uh, the youth of the world, not just America, but the youth of the world in, in, uh, in getting into uh, STEM, STEM arenas. So. few words to that. Um, I spent a good part of my career in the science side of the house, and um, so we, we represent a, a human space flight here, but we're all part of the bigger NASA, and um, I don't know how many of you are paying attention, but we actually went into orbit around dawn, uh, a dwarf planet, last week. That's pretty cool and inspiring to me. I, I don't know about y'all, but I worked that mission, and, and when I saw the white spots for the first time, I got really excited. Um, later this year, uh, Pluto New Horizons will, will fly by Pluto. That, that planet has not been explored, or that Kuiper Belt object, depending on which side of the debate you're on. Um, you know, Curiosity is still exploring Mars today. Messenger is about to end uh, its mission uh, at Mercury. Um, this agency is all over the solar system uh, today, and so I spent a lot of time making sure the kids know uh, that. And, and all you got to do is pick up a kid's science book today. I've got four. Um, and, and have them from uh, middle school all the way through college, and you pick up those books, and you'll see NASA pictures everywhere. The science we do, the, the human space flight, the Hubble images, uh, and that's, that's not coming to an end. That's all, that's all continuing today. James Webb, the most powerful telescope, is being built as we speak, uh, and, and that'll be flying in a few years. Uh, and so we're quietly going about the business of building the most powerful rocket ever built and getting ready to take humans further out in the solar system. And we just have to tell that story. And I try to do as much as I can. I'd like to add to you. Uh, you mentioned Orion. And so uh, I was just amazed, incredulous at the outpouring of support we got from the Exploration Flight Test 1. We got 3.8 billion social media hits uh, out of that event. And, and that's just incredible to me. Um, the outpouring of support we got after the mission has been uh, uh, amazing. Uh, I think I think the country is hungry for for the you know technical leadership for the United States to show some some leadership in space. And so um, thanks to y all of you for getting the word out to people. There's so many things competing for for news these days. And uh, so it's through your efforts. I'm no good. I don't even know how to tweet, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank, thank, thankfully, y'all do, and you can uh, help get the word out for us. Tim Roberts from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, to a child with a hammer, the world looks like a nail, so it's no surprise everybody in the room here is fired up for, about rockets and, and the engineering that's going into the test tomorrow and the Orion test that just happened. But with respect to budget, do we have the moral equity to address the galactic cosmic radiation issue associated with sending people to Mars and an acceptable total ionizing dose and the medicine and biology, not the rocketry, but the medicine side of this equation. I wish you guys could comment on that. I can take a crack at it, Bill. I'm sorry, Dr. <laughs> I can take a crack at it. So uh, ionizing radiation uh, is a, a big concern for us for deep space ex exploration. Um, we, uh, we can shield astronauts, but shielding is ma very mass expensive. And so you know, we try to shave every ounce off our spaceship. And so there is a lot of research going on in the human research program. I'm not an expert at it, uh, looking at ways to uh, shield the crew. Uh, safely and more mass efficiently, as well as uh, certain therapeutics that they can take to uh, minimize their exposure, prevent the, the damage that would incur. 
It is an area, I, all I can say is a big area, it is an area of concern and it is being uh, taken into consideration in the research program that NASA is doing uh, to, to help prepare for going to Mars. But you are going to critical design review. Do you have the shielding you need? Uh, well, uh, Orion is gonna be part of a larger architecture to go to Mars. I mentioned that Orion spacecraft itself, we only have enough expendables to keep four crew alive for about 21 days. So mission to Mars is gonna take years. So we would dock on orbit with a larger infrastructure and the anticipation would be they would go in this infrastructure where they uh, have the proper shielding for the long mission. Yeah, it'd be a habitation module. Okay, you, know, you, our, uh, you know, our, you uh, um, our medical community is keenly aware of this. We're working with uh, um, medical ethicists, I think that's the right way to say it, on how best to do this. Uh, we may find that it's not ethical to put astronauts out there without the proper shielding. Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk about some commercial entities uh, sending folks out there and, and just kind of putting them out there. Um, we're going to make sure we protect our astronauts when, when they go. We're looking at active, uh, active radiation protection. We're looking at, you know, using water encased, uh, uh, spacecraft like a habitat. Um, but we're keenly aware of it and, and we're, it is part of the design space. Thank you. You're welcome. We have time for one more question. And thanks again. Todd, I was pleased and pleasured to see uh, Michoud when the final assembly tower for welding got um, opened up. Thanks for that. Um, I heard mention of maybe like a little bit of a welding issue that you're working on and possibly kind of looking at is it alignment or what are you doing there? And can you just explain that a little bit, please? Yeah, yeah that's a good question, Jeff. So um, this is uh, the, the vertical assembly center. This is where we take all the pieces of the rocket and we put them together to form the core of the rocket itself structurally. Uh, so we've actually performed confidence welding on the on the machine. We know it can perform a good weld, uh, but we have the tower is 217 feet tall, and uh, the kind of accuracy we're we're looking for um, is a Nat's eyelash kind of uh, accuracy. And so when we went to start moving up for the larger uh, pieces, we found some alignment in some of the vertical plates um, that need adjusting. And so uh, we put a team together. Um, we're going to have to actually do some dis disassembly of the of the top ring, uh, loosen up the other two rings, and take those uh, vertical plates and actually adjust them back to the left a little bit. Uh, we think we now have a pretty robust plan to get that back into shape, um, but we want to get it right because um, this is a thing that's going to uh, be welding up these tanks for a generation, and so we're going to take our time and make sure we get it right. Good question. Next, we're going to... Next, we're going to be talking about our test tomorrow. But first, let's roll a video on boosters. So we are getting ready to static fire the QM1 static test motor. It's a full rocket booster. It's made of five segments pieced together. And that's important as we've added another length of a segment into this booster to make it bigger and better. A lot of planning and work is done ahead of time as we design these rocket boosters to get the propellant geometry just right. We know at any given time during the burn of that motor what the, what the thrust is and what the profile of the pressure is inside that motor. So with the new thrust profile for the SLS boosters, we've added an extra fin and changed some of the geometry of our propellant surfaces so we can burn more propellant at the beginning of the test or beginning of the rocket firing. To get a solid rocket booster to burn, we have an igniter at the front end that that it's like a small rocket in itself and it shoots a flame 150 feet down this entire rocket booster and ignites all the surface of the propellant all at once. Once you ignite a solid rocket booster, it can't stop it. You don't flip a switch to turn it on and off. At the same time, you can't turn a knob to increase your thrust or decrease your thrust. That's why it's important to design this beforehand so we can get the amount of thrust we need at each point during this two minute burn to reach the maximum thrust at, at given time points that we need. At the beginning of the burn is when we have the most thrust, about three and a half million pounds of thrust that we maintain for about 25 seconds. It takes just over two minutes of rocket firing for the propellant to completely burn out. And the propellant is burning really fast. It's got a certain rate that it's burning, but it's burning from inside out. So as every second goes by, it's like one layer of that propellant is essentially being peeled away and shot out the end of that rocket motor. And as this propellant burns and, and begins to 
to create this mass that we are projecting out of this rocket, we are creating the thrust that we need to carry humans and astronauts and more weight into space. Welcome back. For those joining at home, uh, remember you can uh, use the hashtag AskNASA to participate in the conversation here. It's our pleasure to introduce our final two panelists to talk a little bit about tomorrow's test and the boosters. Uh, from left to right, we have Alex Priscos, the NASA booster manager, and Fred Brassfield, Orbital ATK's vice president of NASA programs. Gentlemen. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I, I, I'll tell you, several of us have been looking forward to, to years for, for, for this day. It's been busy leading up to here. I'd like to take a few seconds just to back up and, and talk about where we've been and, and what tomorrow means in, in that context. Uh, so, so we started with the development and we uh, came and, and decided for, for this new vehicle, we wanted a much more powerful uh, rocket motor. It started actually on, on Constellation but it had fiscal constraints too. And so I use the analogy of a, 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 a race car. Uh, what we basically did was we, we, we took the chassis in, in the body and, and kind of used what we had from a heritage perspective and we have, have really um, uh, opened the hood and we've made changes, major changes and, and also tweaks to the, to the engine for, for, for performance and, and other uh, uh, factors. Uh, so, so we've we've changed a bunch under uh, under the hood of this. And as you heard earlier, uh, uh, from a thrust perspective, this thing produces about 3.6 million pounds of thrust. Uh, it, it produces about 22 million horsepower. So, just just to put that in perspective, that's about 14 747s all going at the same time, and that's one booster. Okay, so so so. So, so we made these changes as we were going through this to, to, to the inside of this motor. And in the development uh, series, what we were doing, it was essentially analogous to making tweaks to the engine. So, so we came up with our, our, our first design. We had a development test. We then went and refined it. We, we essentially ran it like, like, like you would around the test lab, uh, made some tweaks, did it again. And we've done that three times to where we're, we're pretty satisfied now. We got exactly what we want. And what we're about to do tomorrow is go do the, the, the first qualifying lap. Okay, now, now one difference is we got two qualifying tests that we're going to do, but instead of taking the, the, the best, of, uh, best of those two, both of them have got to work within the specifications. Uh, uh, we, we do these tests uh, so that one is, is done hot and one's done cold because the, the performance characteristics of, of solid rocket motors actually change depending on the, the conditions in which they are when, when they ignite. So, so tomorrow's test for us is a big deal. In terms of performance, it, it, uh, it, it, it really will set the bar for what our standard is. Uh, some of the things that have changed in this motor start with some of the ingredients in the propellant. We've made major changes to the nozzle. Uh, uh, the whole avionics system, as you guys have heard, has been modernized. Uh, uh, one of the things that we ran into in this program, there have been a, a, a few minor things that we weren't suspecting, and, and one was, as you get into a vehicle like this, you, you analyze and assess loads. And what we found out is the loads on this vehicle were a little higher than they were on shuttle. And so one of the things on the forward skirt where we attach to the vehicle, and that's where all that thrust is taken out, it's all taken out in that forward structure. We had to go in and stiffen that up. And we ran a couple of tests, full scale tests of, of old forward skirts here to see if they were adequate for this vehicle. And, and we got wonderful results on, on both. And, and so, so, so for us, tomorrow's a big day. It's, it's the culmination of this. It's what we call four score. Uh, uh, and, and the team has done an excellent job in, in getting ready for it. With that, I'll turn it over to Fred. Thank you, Alex. Um, well, for the one fellow up here that's a res resident of this particular uh, plant, I really appreciate all of you coming. You may find this hard to believe, but we don't get a lot of visitors out here. <laughs> so... How many of you thought you'd missed it on the way out? There we go. But we really do appreciate it. Um, we appreciate you helping us get the word out. We like what we do. I'm tired of going to see my dentist every few months and him going, are you guys still making rockets? I didn't know that, you know, and he's my dentist, crying out loud. So this really helps us get the word out. 
I think you've heard a lot about the rocket. I think you've heard a lot about the program. Um, tomorrow's a really big day for us. We've, uh, we've been incrementally optimizing this particular rocket through this uh, static test phase. It started on the ARIES program. Everything that we learned on ARIES has been absolutely transferred over to this program. Uh, we didn't repeat any of those tests and we move forward. Um, this is our first qualification test as opposed to demonstration, but we have, we have incrementally uh, got rid of mass, increased performance. Alex, as Alex says, we've changed our nozzle. We've seen some things on that that have led to some changes. We've made some tweaks along the way. That's what a development program is all about. Um, we're really excited about moving into qualification from here on out. So we'll try to answer some questions for you. And, I, and I, I've noticed our chief engineers in the background, so we are, we are set if anything hard comes up. <laughs> so. Bill Dunford from Salt Lake City. I've got a lot of people asking me a very simple question. Three and a half million pounds of thrust, how do you hold it down? It's, it's got a, that, that's a really good question and everybody normally asks that. It, it, it's got a very large thrust block uh, at the front of the test stand that, that Charlie Precourt uh, referred to. What you can't see is there's a large concrete infrastructure underneath the test stand itself. And then there's a spider-like takeout structure on the front that helps us um, measure the aforementioned thrust. But it, it is a large, solid structure. And it was, in fact, reinforced and, and modified for this particular vehicle. It was used for shuttle testing for years. But with the additional go power, we've made some changes as well. Hi, my name is Spencer Burgos, and I'm tweeting from Envision EXP. And I have some followers that are just asking, what, what type of engineers worked on the, this type of rocket? Because they're young adolescents and students. And so they're trying to figure out what sort of career path they should go into if they want to work on these types of projects. Yeah, let me, let me start. This is fun. And it's, it's one I love to talk about because I've uh, been in this business for a long, long time, over 30 years. And, and the number of, of skills that it takes to pull something like this off is incredible. Uh, we got engineers that, that, that uh, sp specialize in all different facets of engineering, from chemical engineers to, to thermal experts to mechanical engineers to, uh, to, to uh, electrical engineers that do avionic systems. And so we touch almost every facet of engineering as, as well as is some that are, are closer to the basic sciences. So, so the breadth of skills that we have to pull in to, to pull a project like this off is, is, is really amazing. And it's not this type or that type. It's, it's a compilation of almost every type. And you had talked about the blocks up at the front that were going to be basically grabbing all that. Are those the failed blocks we saw over at that building earlier that were starting, the metal was starting to fatigue? Are those the ones that are catching almost 4 million pounds the of thrust? thrust? that you were looking yeah. at. Yeah, was it almost 4 million pounds of thrust? Yes. Yes, the, the, all the thrust that, that comes out of this vehicle comes out at, at, at that takeout. The, the, it's also attached at the aft, but the aft swivels and allows for compliance of the rest of the vehicle. So all the thrust is taken out at that forward thrust post, and that's probably the, the, the mechanism that you saw that we failed two of those earlier this year on, intentionally. Very impressive. Yeah. Uh, John Hansel, an author from Boston. Um, I actually am going to ask a question that was asked during our tour today, um, but, but now I think we'll be able to get the answer uh, for this one in specific. The, the system that articulates the nozzle, is that a closed or open system? Is that a hydraulic system? Or what, what actually mechanism uh, moves the nozzle around? Well, it's, David's smiling because he, he understands this better than all of us in the room, but it's a hydraulic system. But, but it's, it's, it's more fascinating than that, right? It, 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 it's, all, it's really a, a small liquid rocket system that's powered by hydrazine, okay, that by, powers some turbo pumps and, and then a hydraulic system. It's probably one of the more complicated pieces on, on this booster, and it is a heritage system. Our, our controllers and the, the avionics that we use to control it, a lot of that's been upgraded, but this TVC system pretty much is the, is the system that flew on shuttle. 
and, and David can correct me, but I believe in, in terms of, of, of uh, rotational speeds, turbine speeds, uh, uh, the, the speeds that, that the turbines rotate here, are the fastest speeds that will happen on any of the liquid engines on, the, on this vehicle. Yeah, 72,000 RPMs for those that didn't hear. Hi, Kurt Godwin with the uh, NASA Social tweet from uh, Crow underscore T underscore robot. Now, obviously, environmental conditions have a lot to do with the testing, hence the heat soak and then a cold soak. What about our altitude here? Because we're well above sea level, so how does that impact the test? The, 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 the rocket um, well, obviously doesn't know any difference, but luckily the engineers do. So when they, when they download the, 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 the data, they'll, they'll take into consideration that when they perform the calculations for performance, what what happens here at 5,000 ish feet and translate that back into a sea level number We have time for one more question Hi John bills with uh, sci-fi cantina on YouTube My question is how do you begin testing these boosters with the core vehicle? Will EM1 be that first test or do you have other ways to start testing them together? Other than the ability to do simulations and 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 uh, analyses, the first test is a test. It's, uh, the first full-up flight test is the, the only way to do it. So, so we do have one uh, structural test plan that's called a, a modal test. And, and so we will put the vehicle together and, and we will go, go do some, uh, some modal testing of it just to understand how the, how the various structures interplay with each other. But, but as far as a live firing, Fred's absolutely right. The first time that it'll all go together live will be EM1. We're going to take one last question from social media with Ask NASA question. The grip on scale of the rockets and launch, can you describe the experience, sight, sound through comparisons? Um, let me make sure I understand the question. I think they're asking us to compare uh, how it is to watch a static test versus a launch. Um, if they're asking how it was during the launch, I wish Charlie was still here since he, he wrote a few. But um, there's, no, there's, there's no denying that a launch is, is for me personally, pretty hard to beat. Um, but what you'll see tomorrow, for those of you who haven't seen it, is you'll get the full force for two minutes. It's not going anywhere. And so it was talked a little bit about earlier, but just from a simplistic standpoint, um, you'll see, you, you'll see the, the, the motor ignite, and, and then the shock wave will hit you, and the sound will hit you, and you'll feel it. And it's not unpleasant, but it is stirring. <laughs> and uh, you're dumping five and a half million pounds of, of, of propellant every second. And it, it, it is, uh, it, it's quite an experience. Uh, for, I, I don't know, Alex, if you have well, what, what are the, personal. Well, yeah, it really is. So, so a couple of side notes to think about tomorrow when you're watching this is, is, is we talked about on the video how, how the throttling mechanism for a solid rocket motor is essentially pre-programmed. You do it by the geometry of the grain, the propellant. That, that, that's how you do it. So one of the real interesting things as you're watching this Look, look at the exhaust coming out of the nozzle and also pay attention to the sound and, and, and see what you think may be going on in terms of that throttling because we hit it real hard and then when, when we hit max dynamic pressure on the vehicle, we cut way, way back uh, to reduce that force on the vehicle and, th and then we hit it hard again. So, 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 so use your ears, use your eyes, see what you can figure out is going on. But like Fred said, the neat part about this versus a launch it, it, is you get to hear those things because by the time this is happening in a launch, it's it's a long ways away, and you can't you can't discern the, the, those subtleties. Uh, the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is is there are differences between hot and cold tests. In, in a hot test, we'll burn a little faster. So normally we'd be looking for a nominal burn time of, of about 126 seconds. This one will probably be about 120 seconds. So you can all use your stopwatches along with me. And if we're within a couple seconds of that, uh, th that's as good as we'll do until we start, start to see a bunch of the real data that we, we will take and, and reduce. One more second. There's <clears throat> tomorrow is predicted to be a bit of a, a um, overcast layer up high, and 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 if it is, you'll have even more fun because it it it, 
it makes it even louder. So I think it's going to be a good day. And I really appreciate Joe coming. Well, that's great to hear for those here. Alex, Fred, thank you for joining us. And for those at home, don't forget to tune in tomorrow. You can watch the firing, uh, test firing live on NASA television, www.nasa.gov slash NASA TV. The broadcast starts at 9 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And you can also follow the conversation on social media with the hashtags SLS Fired Up and Journey to Mars. Thanks for joining us.